Good evening, everyone. Welcome. It is um, my utmost pleasure to have you all here tonight to experience the incomparable Monira Al-Qadiri. Um, Modira has been an artist in residence at the Cynthia Woods Mitchell Center for the last year. Um, she started in fall of 2021, giving a lecture actually to the last year's course of Arts and Society. Um, that was on Zoom, of course. Um, but now we, we have her here and the um, exhibition that was able to be realized at the Blaffer Art Museum. Um, a little bit about the Cynthia Woods Mitchell Center for the Arts, um, which supports a variety of annual programs, including visiting artists, scholarships, fellowships, performances, exhibitions, and scholarly research. And the focus of these pro programs is intended to bring together the disciplines and utilize the arts to stimulate dialogue in innovative ways. And our artist tonight certainly does that and has taken up that challenge to push the boundaries of her discipline I would also like to thank Stephen Maticio, um, Tyler Blackwell, and the staff of the Blaffer Art Museum for making this possible, the exhibition. Um, and I'd like to say, thank Sarah Gents and Rima Farrar of the Cynthia Woods Mitchell Center staff. And now I hand it over to my co-director and the chief curator and director of the Blaffer Art Museum, Stephen Maticio. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, and, and I want to pass along my welcome as, um, as well. Um, it's fantastic to have this audience here. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Um, I also want to offer a few thanks, and then I have the pleasure of introducing Manira and giving you a little bit of biographical information, a little bit about her work, before turning it over to the artist. Um, so first of all, thanks. I want to um, return the thanks to Melissa and Sarah and everyone at the Mitchell Center. Really, this has been such an instrumental project and a coming together of the Blaffer Art Museum and the Mitchell Center. And the Mitchell Center has been nothing but supportive of this project, handling logistics, working with Manera, and figuring out the whole multitude of, of things that you have to to realize a project such as this. So a huge thanks to, to everyone at the Mitchell Center. Um, I want to give thanks to Tyler Blackwell. He was the, the former curator at the Black Art Museum. He's now at the Speed Museum. Um, but it was really Tyler's insight and his very broad spectrum of research that brought Manira to our attention. And when he proposed Manira's show to me at the Blaffer, it was something I knew that we needed to pursue. And so, you know, he can't be here this evening, but we definitely want to pass along our thanks and our continuing thanks for all the work that he established and the artists that he brought to Houston. Um, and I also want to thank the Blaffer team very much so. We have a few in the house tonight, but especially young men and uh, Rob Kimberly, our installation staff, because it was, uh, <laughs> there were many challenges. We felt like the ghosts of oil were coming back to uh, kind of like throw a wrench at times into the installation schedule, but everything turned out beautifully. And I very much encourage you to go see Refined Vision at the Blaffer Art Museum. We are always free of charge. The show just opened September 23rd. It will be on display until January 8th. We're open weekdays, 10 to 5, and then weekends, 12 to 5. And we're closed Mondays. But please come and see the exhibition and really experience it firsthand. Um, so now I'm going to give a little bit of biographical information on Manera. And I should also note that this exhibition and through the Mitchell Center, we were able to commission four new works. So there are four world premiere new works at the Blaffer in conversation with some of her existing work. Um, and the, the show, I was really struck when Manera said it was in many ways a self-portrait. And you're going to see the way that sort of the, in the experiences, the observations, the experiences that she had as a child growing up in Kuwait very much inform what the work looks like today and these reflections and how they mutate through memory and sort of future imaginings. Um, and so Manira was, is a Kuwaiti artist, but she was born in Senegal and educated in Japan. And in 2010, she received her PhD in intermedia art from Tokyo University of the Arts where her research was focused on the aesthetics of sadness in the Middle East. 
stemming from poetry, music, art, and religious practices. And it was actually quite illuminating when you said, Munira, how sadness can be a virtue sort of in this, in this realm and can be seen as sort of or translated into a generative gesture. And so I'm sure we'll learn a little bit more about that. But Munira truly is a global citizen. So outside of Senegal, Kuwait, and Japan, she has also spent time, lived in Kuwait, lived in Beirut, and she is currently based in Berlin. And we feel it's an especial cue to have her here tonight because I usually don't go through a whole lot of exhibition listings when I'm introducing an artist because I think sometimes the audience just glazes over. But I really need to recount to you some of the recent shows that she's been in and where they've been. She has solo exhibitions in the Guggenheim Museum Bilbao, the Haus der Kunst in Munich, Sursock Museum in Beirut, Gasworks in London, and Strum den Haag in The Hague. Those are solo exhibitions. She has also participated in collective exhibitions, including Is It Morning For You, the Carnegie International, which just opened September 23rd, The Milk of Dreams, the most current Venice Biennale, Phantasmopolis, the Asia Art Biennial in Taiwan, One Escape at a Time, Seoul Media City Biennial in Seoul, Intermingling Flux, the Guangzhou Image Triennial in, J in China, our World is Burning, Palais de Tokyo in Paris, the Future Generation Art Prize in Kiev, Ukraine, the Lulea Biennial in Sweden, and the Athens Biennial in Athens, Greece. And this is just a few amongst many. So um, Munira certainly has world experience, but it was really the relationship between the Persian Gulf and the Gulf Coast that we were most intrigued by, looking at the resonances between Houston and Kuwait, and societies built in many ways upon the influence of oil and how the petroleum industry pervades so much of our society beyond just oil and gas. And so we were so intrigued from Munira coming to and moving between these places to illuminate that relationship and ultimately speak its possibilities through art. Um, so I've already gone on too long, but um, please welcome Munira al Qadiri. Um, hello everyone, uh, can you hear me? Um, so as uh, Stephen uh, very nicely uh, introduced me, I have a kind of a hybrid uh, cultural background. I mean, I think that's a euphemism. I usually like to call myself a little bit of a mutant because the different kind of cultural influences sometimes are mismatching and they don't fit together very well. But there is some kind of, kind of uh, harmony in, in becoming this uh, mutant um, being, yes. <laughs> um, and I want to today um, introduce my work that is also at the Blaffer, but I want to take you kind of a little bit on a journey uh, through kind of my life and uh, for you to see all of the influences that kind of shaped my work in the end. So it's quite a personal story, uh, but I would like to take you on that journey with me today. So um, I will begin. <clears throat> uh, I grew up in Kuwait uh, in the 1980s, which was a, a strange and interesting period. I mean, I think the 80s was a, a strange and interesting period everywhere. Um, it was kind of the advent of these kind of neoliberal ideas and also um, a period of immense kind of wealth production and decadence, I would say, uh, especially in, in Kuwait, um, because after the 70s there was the oil crash and um, suddenly oil became this very rare and sought after commodity and the kind of wealth behind it really exploded, I would say. Uh, but it was also a period of um, political instability uh, because next door, just next to Kuwait, uh, there was a, a war raging, the Iran-Iraq War, which is often referred to now as the first Gulf War, uh, and it continued for eight years. So, um, yeah, it was quite a, a strange and a time, but I mean, Kuwaitis were living in this very kind of bubble of economic, um, uh, let's say upheaval and uh, new kind of this new found wealth, let's say, uh, to a point where there was also um, a financial crisis. 
um, where this bubble of speculative kind of stock market uh, games <laughs> uh, f kind of uh, imploded at one point. Um, and I, I made a film, uh, a short film about it for uh, Creative Time. Uh, they had this program uh, a couple of years ago called Creative Time Reports, in which artists would report about a certain issue in their country. And uh, yeah, I will just play you a little bit of cl a clip of that. The, the film is called Rumors of Affluence, and it's um, basically I've taken accounts of people who participated in this speculation bubble and uh, their accounts of kind of the, the crazy wealth that they experienced. <laughs> and um, just to give you an idea, because I mean, there's currency in the, in the, in the text, so one Kuwaiti dinar equals three and a half dollars American, just so you understand the, the currency conversion. فمن هذا المنظور تعتبر أكبر أزمة مالية في تاريخ العالم لأن الديون برا نظام المصرفي كانت حوالي 100 مليار دولار عظم أقول لك ما كان يملك فلس موظف بالإعلام حجم تداوله صار 3 مليار دينار أرقام خيالية بعد شعب بكان دلال وكان حتى يسوى مئة ثلاثين صار سعر ست ملايين الكل قام يكشخ بشباب أوروبا بفرنسا وسويسرا وصرنا من أكبر المستوردين رولز رويس في العالم يعني كانت رولز رزايت تهدى يعني سوي لي شغلة أعطيك هدية رولز رويس سيارة مرسيدس أو هكذا تشتري شغلة هاي هدية خمسين ألف دينار ويعني أي واحد كان يهديني so basically I'm just filming a day at the stock market uh, in 2012 but I'm narrating this text from different accounts of people who participated in speculation and at some point the text becomes uh, that I am this person and I bought the Rolls Royce so it becomes a bit of friction towards the end um, but I also want to uh, talk about how the 80s was also a period of all things Americana. <laughs> um, I mean, as kids, we idolized junk food. <laughs> For us, it was like uh, going to a you know, Pizza Hut or KFC at the time, because it was very rare in that part of the world, it was really like a fancy family outing. And we would dream about it for months, and then we finally get there, and we eat these oily morsels, and we were so happy as, as kids. And I even remember making drawings about eating the next uh, hamburger. And my, my generation was also called um, chicken nuggets, um, because uh, we went to these, our parents as a kind of like, uh, you know, um, showing off, uh, societally speaking. They put all their kids in kind of English-speaking schools. That was like the thing to do. So chicken nuggets were basically brown on the outside and white on the inside. That's why, that's why they called us that. <laughs> but it's a whole generation of kids in Kuwait, yeah. <laughs> um, and many years later, I turned this kind of, um, these ideas into an installation called The Craft in 2017. Uh, this was at an institution called Gasworks in London, uh, where I turned the inside of a gallery space into an American diner. Um, and I really thought it was um, interesting for me because uh, these spaces now, where I'm from especially, uh, have kind of gone out of fashion. It's not cool to like eat junk food anymore. It's seen as something that's bad for you or, or you know, terrible. Uh, you don't know what's in it. And so um, I think the impressions have changed really drastically over time. But I wanted to bring back that kind of magical uh, status of it and also kind of shock uh, the audience. So the, 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 inst the exhibition had this installation with a film, uh, also called The Craft, 
uh, and um, another sculpture in the other room. And uh, it's basically about all of these things I grew up with that are now kind of dust, done and dusted, like alien abductions, um, childhood memories, being saturated with this pop culture and uh, junk food, yes. Um, and yeah, the, the film is also about a, a dream I had with my sister that my mom went into a spaceship and the inside of the spaceship was built like an American diner. And I thought, it's, it's so interesting, you know, how these things, pop culture, like, seeps into your mind and your memory and kind of cha shapes your imagination. But I mean, who talks about aliens anymore? It's, it's some, for me, it's so interesting at the time that it was such a prevalent topic, and, and now it's like um, something from a people of old. <laughs> and there was this piece also called The End, which was a floating hamburger made of styrofoam. Um, but uh, it was, next to it was a sound piece that played uh, text about um, modernization in Kuwait and how everyone was uh, designing kind of the architecture of their homes as something that looks like a spaceship, that they've forgotten their roots and their traditions and they're only building houses that look very kind of futuristic. So for me also, the, the hamburger itself is this kind of futuristic architecture at that time. <laughs> um, but of course, all of this abruptly uh, came, to, came to an end uh, in 1990. Uh, Kuwait went through a war, the, the Gulf War, which lasted about a year. And um, I mean, it seems a bit short, maybe even by t today's standards. But it was an extremely destructive uh, war. It was an invasion occupation. The, the country was invaded in one day. Um, and many ruins of this time actually still exist to this day because I feel like uh, the, the war occurred so quickly to a point that, um, let's say, the powers that be started to imagine that you know, Kuwait might be a, a kind of temporary project, that it won't last. And since the war, I mean, it, it went through a very kind of long period of paralysis that I think is still kind of continuing um, to this day. <clears throat> uh, and also the war was the first time that it, it was the first war ever that was live streamed on television. And um, I think that made people um, believe it less. I mean, this is the strange thing that happened at the time is that because it was live on TV uh, for the first time, people couldn't believe that it was actually happening. They thought it was happening in a studio. Um, there was even a book about it called um, The Gulf War Never Happened by Jean Baudrillard. And, but he's, I mean, talking about the concept of how uh, people disbelieve images that they see in real life. But I also think it's a kind of the, the sin of the media organizations that sometimes when they, when they shoot uh, war zones, they shoot um, kind of, for us it was just images of burning oil uh, beamed across the planet, but somehow the oil was detached from the people who live around it. And nobody actually went to see the people and everybody just had this impression of, of oil as if nobody lives there. And, and so I think it, it's, a, it's kind of a, a sin, you know, when you, when you, when you cover a war uh, that you don't actually um, yeah, talk to the people who are living through it. And um, um, I, I have a, another thing that happened also at this time. Um, so I was seven when it happened. And, um, and then uh, immediately after the war, um, the, the oil was burning for about a year and a half. We lived in this a uh, crazy, almost like a, a version of a biblical hell. The sky was black, the ground was burning. It was raining black rain. We, basically, it was the first time kind of we were confronted with oil itself as this consu all-consuming substance. And uh, Werner Herzog, very famous uh, German film director, came to Kuwait immediately after the war when the oil was still burning, and he filmed his famous um, docufiction film called Lessons of Darkness, in which he uh, filmed kind of this very beautiful panoramic view of the burning oil from a helicopter. Uh, and he narrated these biblical texts from the Bible about Armageddon and with a kind of science fictional story about the end of the world. And it had this 
Wagner soundtrack. <laughs> and I watched this film as a child, uh, right after the war, right when it came out. I don't know why my parents had it on a tape, and I just put it in and I watched it. And I was very, very upset because I didn't understand why this uh, German man is making up stories about our war. You know, what is going on here? This is not what happened. Um, so, but then I grew much, I grew older, I went to art school, I found out who Werner Herzog was, and I started to appreciate his films, but I couldn't, I couldn't watch this film. I, I couldn't forgive him for it. <laughs> Until now, I still turn into this seven-year-old child when I watch it. So I decided to make my own version of it to kind of reclaim the context of this event. And so I uh, found uh, an amateur photographer named Adel Yusufi, who took 25,000 photographs of the burning oil. And I asked him why he did that, and he said he, was, um, he wanted to show the extent of the destruction to people outside the country. Um, I mean, it is one of the worst uh, man-made environmental disasters of all time. And, but I actually don't believe him, because he risked his life every day to go and take pictures of oil in a country that is full of landmines, and plus this, I mean, this stuff is toxic and it can kill him. But he did it anyway. I think he was enamored by the, the, uh, the vision of this burning uh, furnace in, in front of him. I, I also, as a child, was quite, um, I was, uh, yeah, fascinated by it. I mean, as a child, you don't understand this kind of destruction or toxicity or poison. You just look at the burning fire and you see beauty somehow, or some kind of sublime image. So, um, so I asked him if he had any videos, and he told me that, you know, I only took photographs, but I have a couple of tapes. Nobody's seen them. You can have them. <laughs> So he gave them to me, and, um, and I really, I mean, I was very touched when I saw them because it was like this shaky camera from the ground where he's filming this oil. I mean, it was very much the, my viewpoint as a child looking at that from this ground level. And so I edited the, the video with a um, text from a kind of Islamic religious poetry um, about the beauty of nature. And uh, yeah, I created this film called Behind the Sun. And um, actually, it's, it's in the Blaffer exhibition, so you can see it. Um, but it's also in the Carnegie International right now, so you can see it there too. <laughs> um, but uh, going back to um, the craft, um, I mean, I think it was um, a strange thing that happened to me that I wanted to I wanted to highlight also through this work the absurdity of living through war as a child. I mean, it's a very different experience than adults, I would say. Um, for me and my sister, Fatima, who was two years older than me, it, a lot of it was very, I mean, it was a very creative time for us. We were, we had no school, even though we had no food and no power and whatever, we thought we were living in this kind of video game world where we were the good guys and they were the bad guys. And uh, my mom, who's also an artist, she kind of shielded us from everything that was happening by giving us paints and papers to kind of, you know, spend the time. So we were stuck at home just painting and drawing all day. And, um, and so I have this, uh, these, and, and, and also the images sometimes can be quite violent, as, uh, even though it's the drawings of a child. Um, and I have this strange, um, uh, interview <laughs> that uh, the family did after the war, and um, it's part of the film is is that I'm I'm using my own life story as a kind of um, conspiracy. So my parents have a relationship with aliens. Um, the war is caused by an alien force. Um, you know, we have to save the world with the kind of hamburgers, and it's, it's like all of these things mixed together in a story. So I'm distorting my own past and my own history to create this uh, image of kind of a post-truth reality that we live in. So I'll just play for you this distorted interview. <laughs> After the war, my family was interviewed by a local TV host. I'm trying to act normal, but I'm dying to tell them what happened. 
I want to tell him all about the aliens, my parents, and the spacecraft that we saw. I try to show them my drawings of the aliens. He refers to them casually as monsters. I want to correct him when my father quickly whispers in my ear, tell him they are enemy soldiers. Afraid to disobey him, I comply. Next time, I'll have my way. I'll tell them all about the spacecraft, the aliens, and the conspiracy. Um, so this is a, quite a long film, but um, I would say another kind of desire that emerged within me during the war was the desire to escape. I mean, it was also to escape what was happening around me, but also to escape the conservative society that I lived in. And um, I was, especially during wartime, very much obsessed with uh, Arabic dubbed Japanese cartoons. Uh, I thought I saw them as a kind of window of another world that I could go to that was colorful and fun. And um, I was very much uh, enamored with this ninja character who used to eat noodles all the time. I don't know why this was dubbed into Arabic, but I really loved this character and uh, I saw myself in him. I, you know, his dark skin and black hair, he looked like me. So I, I really wanted to kind of become him. And also I was obviously in, in love with these kind of robotic cartoons. And, and then I went to Japan at the age of 16 to study art there. I got a scholarship. And, um, but I spent the whole, I mean, decade of my life there. And uh, there's, I mean, a lot of high points, but also a lot of low points. I mean, after spending 10 years in a certain society, you also start to see the dark underbelly of it. <laughs> um, so um, I made a performance about this whole kind of journey from uh, Arabic dubbing into kind of actually living in Japan. And it's called uh, Feeling Dubbing. <clears throat> and I will play a little bit uh, kind of an interview that I did about it. Mm. I went to Japan when I was 16 years old and I was obsessed with Japanese cartoons and um, the moment I arrived there I, I became uninter uninterested in cartoons and I didn't know why. I mean I loved the images but there was something else that was really intriguing me which was the voice acting behind the images. And I, um, I used to watch these cartoons, they were dubbed in Arabic. And um, I watched the original cartoon in Japan and I, I didn't like it, it was, it was terrible. <laughs> And I missed, uh, I missed the, the, the uh, dramatic nature of the Arabic voice acting. So I started becoming also obsessed with this, this voice and who is this voice and where does it come from and, and what's the historical background. So when I left Japan, I decided to go to Beirut where I met uh, one of these voice actors, Wahid Jalal who's a 77-year-old man, he works in the radio station. And I approached him with this project and I told him, you know, I want to, uh, could you please read this text about, which is about my life story. But in a way, it's also about you. And, uh, and it's about you as a voice actor and what you've done to all these millions of Arab children and, and how you've affected their subconscious with your, just with your uh, theatrical voice. Most of the time the puppet is acting me and Wahid Jalal, the voice, is acting the puppet. So it's a, a triple puppetry. <laughs> Peace, I would say. 
Um, I performed it in Belgium. So I was speaking in Japanese and this 3D printed puppet of me was speaking in Arabic. And uh, we had subtitles in English and French and Dutch. <laughs> Explosion of languages. But I mean, this work is also about this, uh, the, this shaping of pop culture. I mean, it's not American pop culture, but it's also Japanese pop culture that kind of formed me. But I mean, also after I came back from Japan, I, I, I um, inherited a lot of ideas, I would say, from East Asia. Um, it's, you know, the, the presence of kind of ancestors uh, in people's lives in that part of the world is very, uh, very prominent. Um, you know, you have a shrine to your grandfather, great grandfather at home, and you, you talk to them constantly, you give them uh, gifts or food uh, during celebrations, so their presence is always around you. Whereas I think in the, in the Arab world, it's very much about kind of forgetting the past. I think also it has something to do with the climate. You know, if you're living in a desert and you, somebody passes away, you have to kind of forget them and move on. Uh, so I was very kind of uh, interested in this uh, topic of ancestral, uh, let's say, memories. Um, and I made this piece called Phantom Beard, in which uh, I speak to them. And uh, why did I make this work that looks like this? Um, so when I left, right before I left Japan, a friend of mine, a classmate, her mother was a ghost reader. <laughs> it's a thing. And she told me that I have 40 men, bearded men, stuck to my body, 40, 40 ghosts. <laughs> and so at the time, I thought it was very funny, and like I didn't believe it. But I mean, over time, I started to imagine that they're there, you know? And what, what do they want from me? And what do they sound like? And what do they look like? And started to imagine, like, when good things happen, are they with me now? <laughs> and so over time, it kind of developed into this obsession that I want to I wanna talk to them. And would we even be able to have a con conversation? So it developed into this also performance piece called uh, Phantom Beard, in which the, the ghosts are projected onto the stage as a, a video, and I would speak to them. Um, and also during this time, I started thinking about my grandfather, uh, Isa, who was a singer on a pearl diving boat, because before the oil industry, the main industry was pearl diving. And they say it may have continued for almost um, 2,000 years, according to some accounts, and then all of that kind of disappeared overnight because of oil. You know, all of the kind of culture, the music, the poems, the literature, even people's names are all based around the object of the pearl. And so I wanted to kind of get close to his presence somehow because he passed away before I was born. I never met him. We only have one photograph of him because he thought cameras and recording devices are the devil's work, so I don't even know what he sounds like. Um, so I started imagining, you know, what kind of songs did he sing and on these boats with men for six months in the ocean looking for pearls. And, and so, uh, yeah, I started making paintings of him. <laughs> and so I, I started collecting kind of this, uh, yeah, these excerpts of, of videos of uh, s singers from kind of a similar background from uh, early recordings. So I'll play you a little bit. <laughs> this is like a solo. <laughs> And so the music is usually, I mean, uh, so the, the singer is on the boat, but also the, the divers and the people who work on the boat are also acting as a kind of percussion and a band and a chorus at the same time. And uh, the lyrics are usually very, very painful and it's all about suffering and uh, remembering your homeland and your lover who left you. I mean, it's, it's, it was a very tough job. They were living in almost, uh, yeah, very kind of, poverty-stricken situations. And I think the music was very much kind of a, a labor music to keep them going, uh, because it was a, a tough, uh, a tough, um, yeah, a tough job. Um, and, and actually, a lot of them spoke many different languages, because they would go to India and Zanzibar, and 
and Iran, and so they had also this kind of um, a lot of cultural influences, uh, and then of course the, the oil came. <laughs> um, so I was trying to find out why why are pearls interesting? Why did people actually pay money for this pearl, which is basically a piece of bacteria that is collected in a shell, and then the shell tries to protect itself, so it makes the substance that turns into a hard pearl. Uh, and then I discovered that actually I had this epiphany that pearls and oil have the same color scheme. It's this iridescent uh, dichroic color, they call it. Um, so, you know, when you see an oil spill on the side of the street, you see this kind of rainbow effect, which is this iridescence. And so I, I made all of these color studies and I started to realize that, you know, they have the same color, it's just on lighter and darker sides of the spectrum. And I thought of this color as kind of the, the radical um, thing that connects me to my grandfather as a, a kind of quintessential post-oil baby myself. Um, this is the only thing I thought that could kind of really connect me to him, is this magical color. And maybe, you know, after pearls and after oil, it will live on in a different form. And it's like this is kind of the magic color that creates uh, wealth. <laughs> And I was thinking about what to coat this color with, and I discovered that actually oil drills, uh, drill bits, are very beautiful, strange, phantasmagorical things. Um, they're usually covered in gold and diamonds to be able to drill better. And if you didn't know what they were, you would think it's some kind of science fictional tool from a cartoon. <laughs> um, and I really loved how they look. I mean, some of them look like octopuses or marine creatures, so also playing on that idea that, you know, the, the pearl comes from the sea. Um, so I made my first uh, public sculpture, which was um, uh, an enlarged oil drill covered in this iridescent uh, color. And it was actually installed in a heritage village in Dubai next to pearl diving boats. Uh, it's not a real boat. I mean, this is all kind of a touristic destination. Um, but the location itself is c true, that it used to be the place where the divers would uh, get on the boats. So I thought it was a great um, place to show the work. I felt that this piece is a, like a self-portrait of my generation. Uh, but in a way, it, it lives in harmony next to the pearl diving boat, which is my grandfather. Um, and it, it was an interesting thing to make. Um, unfortunately, in, in that part of the world, um, even if they tell you it's going to be permanently installed there, <laughs> uh, a year after I had put it there, the whole area was turned into a construction site, and the work was unfortunately destroyed. Uh, I did remake it many years later, but <laughs> I did have a, kind of the shock of my life that this piece that I really kind of thought about was suddenly gone. Um, so I decided to make smaller pieces <laughs> so that I could control them. And so I started making uh, smaller sculptures of, of drills. Uh, this is a work called Spectrum One, which is also at the Blaffer. Um, and it's my attempt to kind of control the, the, the work and also to explore more and more of these forms. And um, so the work is a, a series of oil drills, but they are going from light to darker sides of the color spectrum to reflect the pearls and oil. But also they are 3D printed, made out of plastic. So I thought it's also interesting that the medium itself, plastic, is also made of oil. And um, yes, I, I mean, if you look at them kind of not in their correct context and also covered in this, um, mesmerizing, let's say, color scheme, um, you won't really know what, what they are. And I, I really want to play on that idea that in the future, you know, maybe a hundred years from now, we, we won't know what these things are because we would have divested away from oil many years ago and we might dig them out of the ground and think that there are some crowns or, or creatures that were alive a hundred years ago, uh, ago. <laughs> yes. Um, and I had a lot of these kind of fantastical ideas about them. And for this piece especially, I, I, when I was painting it, I have to put it on a pedestal that turns so that the, the spray goes uniformly all across it. 
and I discovered that actually, you know, they have these very kind of animalistic movements when they turn. I mean, it is supposed to kind of literally destroy the earth. So it has this kind of um, movement, almost like a finger of a, a thing that is alive. Um, and so I had a dream that night that in the future, when um, we live in a very clean planet and uh, we have too much oxygen, that um, instead of drilling the earth, uh, we would use these drills to drill the sky. So I made a levitating sculpture of an oil drill that um, actually, yes, it turns and it drills kind of the air, which is an empty space, but it also is emblematic, I guess, of, um, uh, yeah, the, the inanities of this process. Uh, and I made them into kind of a series of works that I'm still working on these days. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's kind of like a magical realism um, about drilling and the future and, uh, and the past as well. So my work has a lot of this kind of time traveling aspect. Um, then I wanted to be kind of more, let's say, political with the material itself, the material of a pearl. Um, in my kind of laborious exercise to kind of recreate or have connections with history, I, I realized that it was very, what I was doing was very artificial. I'm, I'm trying to do things and explore things that I don't understand and will never be able to access. Uh, especially kind of this pearl diving culture, you know, the way that it's kind of performed now is very much like an advertisement or a Disney movie and all of the kind of poverty and pain is deleted from it and it's distorted, you know, that people like sing this pearl diving songs, it's very fun and nice, but that's not how it used to be at all. So I wanted to carve a pearl into the shape of a drill to be able to show the distortion of this history um, into something else. And so I actually it's kind of impossible to carve pearls. If you carve them, they break. But I collaborated with a Japanese pearl carver. <laughs> there is one. <laughs> he knows how to carve pearls. <laughs> and so I sent him a picture of a drill and I said, can you carve this into a pearl? And he said, yes. And I received this in the mail. <laughs> And so I have three now, and I show them in the, an aquarium environment, which is a kind of a very artificial uh, marine environment. And um, yeah, I, I wanted to kind of put the pearl back in the water, but the pearl is, itself is distorted, the environment it's in it's, is distorted. But at the same time, in all of this distortion, there is some kind of beauty. Um, and then I made a film about this called Diver, uh, in which uh, I worked with a team of synchronized swimmers um, and w I took them to the ocean at night in Abu Dhabi and I made them do a choreography uh, with the, um, a choreograph to the songs of the pearl divers and I made them wear uh, iridescent bodysuits and uh, I will play a little bit of that for you now. <laughs>
Yes. And this piece was actually um, commissioned by the Asia Pacific Triennial in Brisbane, Australia, because they also have a history of pearling there. Um, but as you can see, the music is very, you know, it's really not this kind of um, beautiful thing you imagine. It's, you know, it's very guttural. People are screaming. It's, it's not a kind of a, you know, a fun uh, music to kind of listen to. But um, of course, there is joy in it. But it also reflects the kind of the, the pain and the suffering that these divers went through. Um, and then uh, last year, I made my ultimate pearl drill ever. <laughs> I don't know how to say this in the inches and feet, but it's five meters tall. Um, so this was part of the expo also in Dubai. Um, and this time it's made of metal and it will never die. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm very happy to have made this piece. Uh, it's also the color of it, I think, is the closest thing I've ever been able to come close to kind of the color of oil. And also the shape is very kind of mimicking the, the shape of pearls. So uh, I'm very happy to have been able to do it, even though we started right at the beginning of the pandemic and also the whole expo was delayed for a full year, but it exists, it's there, I'm happy. <laughs> it's also my first permanent art work. Um, and, after this, um, in, in, um, actually this was also in 2020, 2019, 2020, I started to think of pearls in a, from a, let's say, a different world in a different light. Um, I, you know, pearls come from the sea, but uh, I discovered that there's actually this type of pearl called the Wabar pearl, which is found in the middle of the desert. Uh, and it's it black and shiny, and it looks like a pearl. Obviously, it isn't, but um, I was very intrigued by the story of these pearls. Um, and so they're found in the Empty Quarter Desert, which is this huge desert uh, that they say is bigger than France, um, that is in between basically Saudi Arabia, Yemen, um, Oman, and the United Arab Emirates. And in the middle of this desert, uh, these pearls are found next to these crater-like places. And uh, according to local legend, um, the, this used to be a site of an ancient city uh, that was very decadent. And uh, God punished these people by burning their city down and all, everybody died. And all that was left was the pearl, burnt pearl necklaces of the women there. So this was kind of the local lore. And then there was an interesting uh, British explorer in the 1930s named uh, Harry St. John Philby, who later became the advisor of the King of Saudi Arabia. <laughs> but in the 30s, he wanted to be a famous archeologist. So he heard of this story and he was uh, very kind of tempted uh, to go uh, and find this ancient Atlantis of the Sands and that you know, he was dreaming about being a famous uh, you know, explorer. So he changed his name to Abdullah Filibbi and started wearing this Arab garb and learned Arabic and uh, along with kind of a team of, of local men uh, set out into the desert looking for uh, the Atlantis. <laughs> uh, and uh, there he found these two large craters that you know, could look like a ruin with all of these black pearls around them. And so the locals explained to him the story that you know, this used to be a city and the women used to live here, used to wear pearls. And of course he didn't believe them and he was supremely disappointed. Um, and he thought it was a kind of volcanic crater but these locals don't know anything, they don't know what volcanoes are. So um, he had this whole, um, let's say, uh, journey into his disappointment. And, uh, but he took back some of the pearls to the British Museum and they told him that these are not uh, volcanic rocks but they're actually meteors from outer space. So basically there was a meteoric strike there maybe a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, nobody knows. And the, the, the meteor fused with the sand and made these black beads. 
So I created a, an installation um, out of this uh, story, let's say, where I blew up the size of the black pearls into glass sculptures. And basically the film is narrated by them as this kind of sentient uh, multiple being <laughs> uh, that talks about this pale man who came to the desert and disturbed their sleep. <laughs> um, and for me, it was an interesting kind of next frontier, thinking about pearls not in the sea, but in, in land, in the desert, and also as a, a kind of alien entity. Uh, and also, I mean, obviously, they look like drops of oil as well. So I'm mixing kind of a lot of different layers into this work, um, also kind of the, the hubris of the colonial mind uh, venturing into the desert um, to look for fame and fortune. Um, there was also a, an interesting, uh, I mean, the script is made up of kind of, um, let's say, my original texts, some religious poems, uh, scientific texts, all mixed together into this kind of narrative, and, and also texts from Philby's own memoirs. Um, but I wrote a line myself, in, in, I mean, this was written in the end of 2019, and um, I don't know why I wrote it, but... <laughs> I basically wrote that the earth will be ruptured by the great disease. <laughs> and, you know, um, sometimes as artists, you try to be so avant-garde that you start to become a fortune teller. <laughs> and I found it really interesting, you know, and I heard this from so many artists, friends of mine, that, oh, I wrote, you know, this whole entire play about wild animals and, and viruses. And, you know, it's, it's strange sometimes how you can do that as an artist sometimes. So I, I, I'm very interested in fortune telling now because of this experience. <laughs> um, yes, and maybe next I will show you some things from uh, Refined Vision, uh, the exhibition at the Blaffer. Um, so uh, the first work you will see there is, a, so there are four new works. This is also a new commission. Uh, it's called Crude Eye. I only have iPhone photos, sorry, it's just uh, <laughs> brand new. So. Um, but this is a, a work about um, growing up next to an oil refinery in Kuwait. And I tried to make works for this show that would resonate w with audiences here as well as, as myself. So, for example, you know, refineries are also part of the landscape here. And we, we have this shared history be between Houston and Kuwait and Saudi Arabia of this kind of urban landscape that we live in uh, that is very similar, you know. Um, the oil industry actually in that region was developed by uh, Texas oil men, you know. So we also have um, kind of copies of urban landscapes, like uh, some parts of Saudi Arabia really look like Houston, you know, the way the houses are designed and the streets. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting how that happened. You know, we, we live, you know, half the way across the world, but we have these shared, um, let's say, memories and visions and places. So one of the things I had when I was a kid growing up next to refineries is that I thought it was the most futuristic, most beautiful thing that I've ever seen. Uh, I thought it was like a city from the future. I thought it was like Manhattan and the people lived in those towers. I thought it was a skyscraper. I, I, you know, I thought it was something like uh, from a science fictional movie. And we used to swim next to it, actually, in, in these pools of oil and We'd come out of the sea and my mom would wash our feet, the oil off our feet. And you know, at the time, nobody really discussed anything about toxicity or environmental destruction. It was strange that we just lived with these things that are potentially very, very harmful and very, you know, uh, also cancerous. Um, so the film, uh, when you see it, I mean, I'm going to give away the trick now. You think you are looking at a real thing, and, it, and the, the, the image of the video is very large uh, in the space, but it's actually, um, in Kuwait, we're not allowed to film them or photograph them. It's a security issue. So I recreated this out of my memory as a miniature model in my studio. <laughs> Uh, so this is what it looks like. Uh, it's uh, very small. <laughs> and we filmed it as if it was life-size. 
And um, actually, during the opening, I was very uh, pleasantly surprised how many people thought it was real. <laughs> you know, and, and the image obviously is, is a little bit of, you know, duping you to think that this is a real place. And there was a lady also who said, uh, how did you manage to film a refinery without any workers in it? So I was very happy that my trick worked. But, uh, but I mean, the film is supposed to confuse you, that you sometimes look at something and you think that it's, it's real, it's big, but then you look at the details and you start to see kind of a piece of plastic coming out of here and drops of glue, and you start to think that, is it fake or is it real? What is the scale of this thing that I'm looking at? So I wanted to also kind of recreate this, this dreaminess about, about the scene, because that's what I felt uh, as a child growing up next to them. And then in the next room, you see uh, the back of this guy. <laughs> um, so I, I don't want to talk too much about the works there, but because I want you to see them. Um, but uh, basically, it's a dinosaur that sings in autotune, a uh, karaoke song in autotune. And uh, I thought autotune is, is a very interesting uh, you know, uh, vocal effect that is very widely used in the music industry today. And it has an interesting history that it was actually developed by um, an oil engineer, uh, because actually uh, oil engineers use um, seismic and acoustic data uh, to find oil. It's, it's, it's these kind of graphs. This is also another work called Reservoir. But they make, uh, they have re really, really advanced acoustic instruments to try to kind of find oil in the ground. Um, so one of these engineers um, thought that he could use this um, uh, tool to be able to uh, tune a singer's voice. Uh, so I thought it was a, a fun thing to work with, to imagine the dinosaur, which is basically what, you know, oil is made of ancient animals and uh, plankton and organisms, and also the remains of dinosaurs cooked together over 400 million years to become the oil that we use in a millisecond. <laughs> so I imagined that the dinosaur was uh, singing back to the kind of oil, uh, oil engineer and asking him to find him. <laughs> um, another work is called, it's also a new commission called Jurassic Gauntlet. Uh, these are two oil drills that I really like because they look like uh, fingers or hands. And so, actually, I created this animatronic system where the fingers move as if they're looking for something. And also, there's two of them coming out of the wall, so they also mimic kind of the, the hands or the talons of a dinosaur. <laughs> uh, and this is the last work that is also newly commissioned. Um, this is quite a, a heavy piece, I would say. Uh, these are birds made out of glass. Um, so when I lived in the war in Kuwait, um, you know, the environmental destruction was huge. There was, you know, livestock and animals and birds and fish all covered in oil and dead and, you know, all over the landscape. And that was kind of our reality at the time. Um, but when I left uh, Kuwait, actually when I went to study in Japan, uh, I discovered that actually a lot of people thought that these images were faked. Uh, I was in an advertising class in art school and my professor pulled out a picture of an oil-covered bird in Kuwait and he said that this was staged for, uh, you know, war propaganda. And he went on and on about it for about two hours and I was so, uh, you know, upset, but I, I was so upset that I couldn't say anything. But um, in a way, because I heard this kind of tirade for so long, that I started to suspect my own memory and my own experience. And did I, was it what I saw, was it, was it real? And um, I wanted to make this work to kind of give the life back to this, uh, you know, uh, horrible scene that I saw, but also make it out of glass to kind of highlight the fragility of also our memories and our appreciation of reality, even realities we've experienced ourselves because we live in this post-truth world where everything is malleable and changeable and nobody believes anything anymore. <laughs> All right. So yes, this is the duck. <laughs> I will take three questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Go. <laughs> so, 
So I don't know if you know. I mean, obviously, you do hear uh, these. Uh, there's. How does how do I paint the that multicolored paint that I use? Um, I'm sure here you're very familiar with these um, very extravagant car paints, uh, like these. They're called hot rods. I don't know exactly. But a lot of this paint is made in America for cars and motorcycles and things like that, and they develop new colors all the time. Um, so yeah, they, they make this beautiful iridescent paint that I use for my sculptures. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. Where do you see? I know this is in a lot of your art, but I reckon a lot of it is like that, very contrasting. Where do you see that taking, I guess, a new turn? Yeah, I mean, my work is always kind of having kind of two emotions at the same time, I would say. So it's funny, but it's tragic. Um, uh, so I, I, it's seductive and beautiful, but it's also a tool of destruction, like the, the drills are. So I always try to kind of mix these two elements together in my work. Um, and also the past and the future, that they exist at the same time somehow. Um, I also look at you know, oil as, a, as that kind of entity. I mean, it's, it's a miracle and a curse, you know? It's a, it's, it's, it's destruction, it's destroying our environment, but at the same time, we can't live without it because it's revolutionized the way we live. How do we reconcile these issues together? So I don't have any answers. What I'm doing is trying to kind of pose questions uh, from both viewpoints. And so, yeah, the, the time also issue, the, 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 the aesthetic issue, and also the, the conceptual issues always the opposite things existing in one body. Yes. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Last one. <laughs> so yes. How long did it take to make it? I worked on it for two and a half years. <laughs> yes, that was. A you know, public art is a completely different animal. Uh, if you show work inside a museum or a gallery space, everything is controlled. The environment is controlled, the people are controlled, the temperature is controlled. But once you make a, a work in public, it, you know, it's like you have to think about the rain and the wind and the, and you know, will the, the paint crack? Will people punch it? Will, you know, will there be vandalism? So you have to create it, and also safety issues and all of that. It's a completely different thing, uh, but I am very, very passionate about making art in public space. Uh, next week, actually, I'm installing a series of five sculptures on the seaside in Qatar. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm working in, in public art. It's, it's something I love to do. And also, I love the way it gets old. Like, there's art in public that's been there since the 60s, and it's moldy and, and kind of like scratched up. And, but you live with it, and you kind of interact with it, and it becomes part of the place and part of your memory as well. So that's something that you can't achieve, I think, sometimes with art in, let's say, closed spaces. Yeah. All right. So thank you very much. <laughs>